Hey, so we're so glad that you're checking out this video and our prayer is that it helps those who are far from God become committed followers of Jesus Christ. However, what we don't want is for this video to be a replacement for church. It can't be a replacement for church. We believe that the gathering of believers in covenant community with other believers at the local church matters. And what's more is that God designed us to be in community with one another. That said, if you're in the North Georgia area and you don't have a church you call home, we'd love to have you come and visit Brainerd, North Georgia. I'm praying that this message serves as a blessing to you, that it helps you, encourages you, and even challenges you, all the while bringing you closer to Jesus. So again, super excited that you're checking out this video. Just don't treat this video as a replacement for church, and I think that the Lord will honor that and see your commitment to the local church. All right, you guys ready to dig in? All right. The title for this morning's sermon is... Like father, like son. Now, many of you guys have more than likely heard that term before, like father, like son, and it brings about a lot of different ideas. Uh, for me, uh, I couldn't help but to think about one individual um, that's uh, a mentor from afar. His name is Jimmy Scroggins. He's the pastor of a family church down in Fort Lauderdale and uh, was formerly First Baptist Church of Fort Lauderdale. But anyway, he's done a, a great job over there. And uh, I just love learning from his leadership and how he pastors that church. But one of the cool things that I found out about Jimmy um, is the fact that he's got nine kids. No, excuse me, eight kids. He's got eight children in his house, six boys, two girls. And it's wild, <laughs> the Scroggins house to say the least. And uh, one of the neat things about um, family church is that they are spread out um, with 10 different campuses all around the Fort Lauderdale area in Florida. And uh, their kids are old enough that they're, they're basically spread out in different places all over these different campuses. And uh, the church is big enough that a lot of people don't necessarily recognize um, all of their, all of his kids. They they know who Jimmy is because, of course, he's the lead pastor of that church, and uh, often most of the congregants have an idea of who that person is. Uh, but what's interesting is, as his kids have kind of spread out all over the place with all these different campuses, um, there are certain characteristics about his kids that make them Scroggin kids. Whether it's the way that they talk or whether it's their facial features all the rest. And so undoubtedly, without them probably even knowing that they are in fact part of the Scroggins family, they begin to kind of see the hints that are being dropped. And they're like, man, you sound like, you talk like, you look like your daddy. Are you a Scroggins? And they're like, guilty. You know, <laughs> like I'm one of them. And it's undoubtable. Why? Because like father, like son, right? I mean, that's part and parcel of it, right? When you read through the Word of God, especially here in First Peter, there is a lot of identity language that is found within this letter, one of which that we're going to cover even here today, that speaks to us and calls us children of God. And so we are, in many ways, as that adage goes, like father, like son, right? There are things that God begins to do within our lives that as He shapes us and molds us more into Jesus we begin to look like who our Heavenly Father, like Jesus, is. And you take that adage, right? Like Father, like Son. And one of the things that this text brings up is the fact that we are called to be holy as God Himself is holy. And that is a tall task uh, in order for us to be able to do. I mean, especially when it comes to what that means. It's moral perfection. It's purity, right? But that's what God calls of us to live like, is to live holy, to live this new kind of ethic within this world. Now, as you and I begin to live out what it means to be holy like God is holy, we begin to kind of make a rub against what culture lives like, what the world lives like, right? And then you begin to kind of feel in many ways, just like we've titled this series, we begin to feel like exiles or even peculiar kind of people, right? We're strangers in a world that we live in, but yet we feel really out of place. And here's the thing, the moment that you begin to live this kind of holy ethic, right, this different way of living with Jesus, it changes the way that you think, it changes the way that you live, it changes the way that you speak. Right? 
And so in many ways, from your speech to your conduct, your character, all of a sudden begins to make a strike of a difference within culture and within this world, right? I mean, just think about it. Just from what you say or just by what you are convictionally set on, you can feel what it means to be kind of out of place in society these days. I mean, think of last week, right? What a monumental, huge thing that happened. If you didn't turn on the TV, maybe you don't know, right? But you had this leak that came out of the Supreme Court of uh, the abortion bill with uh, the abortion law back all the way back when, 60 plus years ago of Roe v. Wade, right? And mind you, there's a lot of discussion when it comes to the subject matter of abortion and all the rest. And all of us as believers in Jesus, we are convictional when it means that we know that there is, we need to assign dignity, worth, and value to the womb. Why? Because we believe that it's a child that's in that, in that womb, right? And so when you begin to speak that way, or you begin to stand for those kinds of convictions, even if it's something like that, you almost feel a little out of place or distasteful within society. In fact, we become rather peculiar, right? And that, I think, is what Peter is bringing up here. He says, listen, you and I as Christians must live as peculiar people on earth. Why? In light of the glorious hope we have in heaven. Another way of thinking about that, guys, is that we understand that there is a future reality that all of us are who name the name of Jesus are going to be a part of. And that future reality changes the way that we live in the present. What we know about Jesus, what we know about the Word of God, what we know what God calls us to changes the way that we live. And here's the thing. We can live with a great deal of certainty right now. Live convictional, live holy the way that God calls us to live because we know the truth about the future. We know the truth about our Savior, right? And so in light of all of that, Peter says, I want you to live as God calls you to live. I want you to live holy, which means you might live peculiar in front of the world. But that's our assignment while we're here on this earth. And then it begs the question, Paul, how do you live in that particular way? Peter here answers for us the means of which we are to live as peculiar or strangers or exiles in this world. Listen, there are three truths, I believe, from this text that help us understand how to live this way. Here are the three of them. One, as believers, we live with hope. Secondly, we live holy right? And then lastly, we are to live in reverence to God or for God, I should say. Man, I tried to find an H, you know, but it did, I don't, if you want to put honor, go for it, right? So hope, holy, honor, whatever. Anyway, this is how God has called us to live. Let's begin with this first one, which is believers live with hope, okay? Uh, Ashley was kind enough to read us the text this morning, and verse 13 uh, begins to help us focus our attention as to how we are to live. And here within the text, it says very clearly, we are to set our hope on the things of the future, okay? Here, this phrase, set your hope, is not only a command, but listen to me, it's the command that's at the center of the rest of this verse. In other words, everything else said in verse 13 is intended to add further understanding to the word hope, okay? But here, at a base level, we are commanded to hope. And then it begs a question, right? To hope in what? The text says to hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter here is peering way into the future to help us understand that we need to have our minds in the hope that we have in the future, along with the grace that God has given to us. So here, as followers of Jesus, we are to live in such a way that our greatest desire is for God to finish the work that he began through Jesus. Okay, in other words, God saved you, that's grace. He's changing us, that's grace. And what we want more than anything else is for God to finish that work in my life, grace and carry me home. All of it 
is grace. And what we long to be able to see is that revealed at the end of time, right? We want God's finishing work to be accomplished within our lives. Think about it this way. The same grace that forgave your sin is the same grace that kills your sin, and it's the same grace that empowers you to overcome sin, and it's the same grace that carries you home. That's what Peter is talking about here, right? So here in this 13th verse, Peter is causing believers to have long-term goal in mind. I, I want you to think way, way ahead. Think about it this way. When I was in college here uh, at Tennessee Temple University, I would, every Christmas and every summer break, I would have to make the long haul to go all the way back to Miami. And it would take anywhere between 12 to 14 hours to ride solo all the way back to Miami. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever been in a car for 12 or 13 hours or 14 hours, you're like, get me out of this car now, right? Now, there were other times, and um, I should, probably shouldn't repeat this because my mother's in this room, that I made it quicker <laughs> than that, but, but that's okay, right, Mom? <laughs> anyway, but needless to say, it was a long trip. And, and here's the thing, for me, what kept me motivated to, to be able to just endure that time of getting all the way down to Miami is, I, I would have in my mind, okay, once I pass Dolphin Mall, I'm about 30 minutes away from my home. And then, and then the, the, the aroma be, begins to just travel up to my head. What, what, what aroma are you talking about? I'm talking about that Cuban food that was waiting for me when I got home, right? I'm talking about the rice and beans, like arroz con frijoles, and that steak, that skirt steak, man, that you put, la cebollita, the little onions, and all those. Oh, man, it was, it was glorious, right? And then on top of that, the, the cherry on top, it was the cafe con leche that my mom would make, right? It's like Cuban coffee. It's like, Mom, I'm coming home, right? But that's what kept me motivated to say, I just got to keep going. I got to keep my mind focused on that Cuban dish and that cafe con leche because, man, it's going to be glorious when I get there because I haven't had it in like in months, right? Here, what Peter's saying is, I want you as a believer to have your hope set on what is your future, okay, and what God is going to do. And he says that becomes the motivating factor in many ways when you think about it that the truth of what we know in the future changes and determines the way that we live in the present. When you know the truth, man, that changes everything about how you live even today, right? And so what Peter's doing here is he's like, look, I, I want to shape your identity and I want to change your attitude. Not only are you a child of God, but I, I want to change your attitude about how you live right here, right now. And Peter here says, I'm going to attack the mind. I want your mind set on the hope that is to come. And I love this. If you've ever read this verse in, in the Old English, the, the King James Version, bless God. Uh, I love, I love, and I love the King, no, no knock on it, I love the King James Version. It's good. It's a good translation. I promise. I have no knocks on the King James Version, right? But if you remember you read this verse, it says, gird up thy loins, right? It's a really cool way of thinking about this because I think contextually back in the day, it really captures the understanding, right? It's, it's, a, it's a way of, of saying, be sober-minded, okay? Or you better sober up. That's the intended meaning behind gird up thy loins, right? It's an idiom. And you guys know what an idiom is, right? How many of you guys have ever heard the term, it's raining cats and dogs? Okay, right. It's an idiom. That means it's, a, it's pouring. In Miami, you would say, tremendo aguacero, right? Like, it's just pouring down rain everywhere, Right? That's what it's intended. And it's an idiom that would have been a reminder for people to say, okay, I know what he's saying here. He's reminding everybody that back in the day, men would have these long robes. And what they would do whenever they had to get to work is that they would lift up their robes, they would tie it so that they wouldn't be encumbered with whatever work that they had to do. Okay? They, they would be ready for action, ready for work. We would say it this way, roll up your sleeves. Right? Let's get to work. Right? That's what Peter is communicating here. And he's saying, well, why in the world is he making such an emphasis on making sure that we sober up and that we have our minds focused this way? How many of you guys do this thing called life? There should be all of you in this room, right? And here, what he's saying is, I want your mind set and focused on the hope because 
life is going to be lived. And so what he's saying here is, I want you to prepare your minds for action. For what? For everyday life. For what this world throws at us. For the trials that come your way. For the hardships in life. For work, for marriage, for parenting. You name it. Everything here is up for grabs for what Peter is talking about. And it's there in that context that he says, I want you to prepare your minds for action by filling your mind with the truth of God, with the word of God. And in particular, he says, I want you to fill your mind with the hope that you have and the salvation that you've been given. And you might be sitting there saying, that's it? Yeah. Hope and your salvation. Now, you think about this for just a moment, okay? Peter has been building this up all the way from chapter one. Don't forget who saved you, who changed you, right? All of that stuff. But then as he begins to help him understand that I want you to focus your, your attention on hope and salvation, again, like I said, is that enough? Is that exactly? Yeah, it is. And so think about it. How do you learn how to love someone more and more each day, particularly when they're hard to love? You look to the cross and you see God's love for you through Jesus. And then all of a sudden, when you are captivated by that kind of sacrificial love for you, it changes you, right? Think about it this way. How do you forgive others when they're hard to forgive or when you've been hurt? Well, when you know how much mercy and grace God has given you through Jesus, well, that's a game changer, isn't it? Then all of a sudden you begin to exude forgiveness and love towards people. When you're gripped with greed, and then you realize that this life is temporary and eternity is a reality, well, that changes the way that you look at stuff, that changes the way that you think about how you even utilize your money, Right? Many of us understand this even too, right? How many of us have a nest egg? You don't have to raise your hand. I'm just saying all of us are like, man, we need to have a nest egg, right, for the future. And so what do you do? Uh, you know, old Dave Ramsey quote, right? You live like no one else now so that you can live like no one else later, right? And so the idea is I'm willing to have delayed gratification now because it may make the difference later. And so here, this is what Peter's even bringing up. When you look at the cross, and you look at the hope that you have, oh, man, it changes the way that you even handle your stuff. Why? Because you realize that's reality. And my, my hope is set on something that is forever. Do you see what hope and salvation does to an individual? Think about it this way. We need to have our mind and our heart in heaven, but our feet on earth. You know what that does to somebody? It keeps them, yes, heavenly-minded, but gospel-driven. Because you realize that God left me on this planet for a reason. And it's not just to have my heart so sealed on heaven that all I want to do is hit the eject button and I'm going to heaven. It's that I realize that God left me on this planet to change me and to use me for his glory. Be heavenly-minded, but gospel-driven. Right? Do you see how a believer is affected because they have their hope set on Jesus and on the future, right? And then he doesn't stop there. Now he goes to, hey, we need to live holy, right? Believers are called to live holy. Notice what verses 14 through 16 say. It says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. So Peter here helps his readers understand that the call to holiness, to command really, right, is intended to be viewed in two ways, right? To be holy as God is holy requires that we don't do certain things and we do something. So here he, he positions everybody to listen and to pay attention to say, don't do this stuff, but do this, right? And your translation may not bring that up completely, but I love what the New English translation does with this verse. Man, it, I really do think that it brings out the sense of what Peter's conveying here. Listen to what the New English Translation says. It says, like obedient children, do not comply with the evil urges 
you used to follow in your ignorance. I love that. It's very clear in terms of the don't do this. So Peter here is reminding his readers, yeah, I know that all of you have been saved. I get it. And y'all have been justified because of Jesus' finished work on the cross. But all of y'all, including me, are still a bunch of functional sinners. Okay? And so on the one hand, he says, I know that you are saved, sealed. You're going to heaven. This is awesome. But you still need something more to be reminded of because I know that you are tempted. I know that you're dealing with the world. And I know that you have this thing still on you called the flesh. And so he says, I want you to make sure to do something. And he says, don't be conformed, all right? Which means to continue to do something. That's what that word means. So Peter here connects the word conform to a period of life. He says, don't be conformed to your former way of ignorance. Like, geez, Peter, tell me what you're really thinking, right? It's a strong way of him saying, do you remember how you used to live before Jesus changed your life? Do you remember when you thought sin actually led to freedom, but it actually led to your enslavement? And so he's saying to them, you now have been rescued and freed from sin in order to truly enjoy what it means to be free from sin. Now, mind you, this is why he begins the verse with such great identity language. He says, as obedient children. So he tells them right then and there, this is who you are. You're a child of God. You're a child of the kingdom. You're a child of light. You used to be a child of wickedness and a child of darkness, but that's not who you are. You're someone different. And so he's telling them, live like whose you are and who you are. You're a child of God. So live holy as he is holy. So he says, don't do that. Don't be conformed to this world. And man, he just goes immediately and switches gears on him. He says, look, I want you to listen to this. Look verse 15. But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. Why? Because God is holy. Therefore, we are to be holy. That's the standard. The command here to be holy, which means be pure, be righteous, be set apart, be consecrated to God. That's what that word holy means. In other words, God saved us and he set us apart to live holy like him. And I think all of us can understand this. How many of you guys had growing up that sacred furniture that nobody was supposed to touch? Okay, maybe a few. Or you had had your grandparents that wrapped their furniture in plastic. How many of you guys? You had that? I had that. Mom, you remember that? Yeah, yeah, man. She was all about that, right? And my gosh, man, me as a little kid, whenever I would go out and play, and I get all hot and sweaty, and I come back, and I sit down. It was like peeling off human Velcro off of that couch, man. It's the wildest thing in the world. I was like, what is this thing, man? It was nasty. I was like, oh, this is horrible. You get so sticky and hot on that thing. But what happened? That was the furniture that you were not supposed to touch, or they tried to preserve the furniture as much as possible. And mind you, at our home, you remember this, Mom, where we had that white furniture that nobody was supposed to touch? And it was white on purpose, because if any one of us touched that thing, they would know. They would know, right? And then that, that Cuban sandal, chancleta, would come at you, man, is what it would do. Here, <laughs> seriously, that's what would happen. You guys think I'm jo- I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> but anyway, um, here what Peter's talking about is that that's what holiness is supposed to be like. It's something that is set apart. You don't touch it. You preserve it. You consecrate it, right? I love how John Piper talks about God's holiness. Listen to this. He says, God's holiness means that he is so separated from all that is ordinary, indeed all that is created, that he is in a class by himself, one of a kind, like the rarest of diamonds. We call this kind of separateness transcendence. And the Bible adds a moral dimension to this transcendence so that we call it transcendent purity or goodness. God's holiness means that he is perfectly separated from all that is finite and all that is defiled. That's God and his holiness. That's who he is. Guys, that's that's what he's called us to. Now, 
We have that reality, but there's another reality as well that we all have to obviously acknowledge, right? And it's this. All of us can agree that upon salvation, God had his work cut out for all of us, right? Because we're all broken and messed up, and we all need much of his grace, right? Which means that none of us, at the moment of salvation, come out functionally perfect. It doesn't happen that way, right? I say that because the command to be holy here is to be understood as, listen, to begin to be holy, okay? In other words, your sanctification is less microwave and more crockpot, okay? It takes time. And God is in the business of making sure that he uses this lifetime to sanctify you. The call to be holy is a lifetime of a call to be holy, okay? And the goal, the aim of which God is shooting for is him. That's his standard, which is incredible. So, follower of Jesus, this is encouraging, while at the same time so important. One, it's encouraging to know that God, God is going to take his time with you. And he knows perfectly how to be able to shape you. But in the midst of shaping you, you can't, you can't run away from the backdrop of this, right? Here we are living as exiles, living differently. And the more that God changes us, the more that we live in that way that's peculiar towards people. But yet it couldn't be at a better time and a more appropriate time that our holiness, our way of living, our conduct, our character can make such an impact in a world that's so morally confused. And yet here we have such clarity. God's aim is holiness, right? The, the world is over there thinking to themselves, trying to figure out what truth is. A Christian should never say, well, I wonder. No, it's clear. We have truth and it is absolute and it is objective in every way possible. And so your holiness is a beacon to the world to show them that the change that God is making is going to prayerfully show the world this is what God does to broken people. He not only changes them, but their vibrancy and holiness gives them clarity. Guys, not only is that encouraging for how we live, but, but man, how encouraging it is for many of us in this room that we thought in our lifetime that we were the most unlikely of candidates for God to change us. And yet, you're precisely who God changed, and now he's taking those ashes and turning them into beauty. That's what God's holiness does. Listen, he cares about you. He loves you, not when you were at your best, but precisely when you were at your worst. And he says, watch what I'm going to do with that broken individual. Watch what I'm going to do with that person who was enslaved and addicted to things. Watch what I'm going to do to that person that didn't even give me a, a, a time or a day. And now they can't stop talking about me, and now they've been freed. Listen to me, that's what God's holiness does. Why can't we be convinced that God can take people who prior had those kinds of things in their lives, addicted, they had no sort of bearing on life, they had no purpose, they had no meaning, they had no significance, and yet now he gives them all of those things and changes who they are. It's beautiful. And here's the thing, guys. Something happens to the world around us when they see radical change inside of you. Something happens. They take note and would you know that both through your words and your actions, it can change the heart and life of someone? We've been walking through this book by D.A. Carson. It's an awesome book. It's called The God Who Is There. And there's one particular chapter where D.A. Carson talks about an individual back in 1942. Now, if you know your history, that's an important year in our American history. Okay, Listen to what D.A. Carson says quickly. He says, in April 1942, Jacob de Shalzar, who was a bombardier in the Doolittle Raid over Japan. That's the raid that basically turned Tokyo into a furnace. Okay? That's where we get our, that's where we're at. He, he goes on to say, with four other crewmen, he bailed out. The two of them were executed. The others spent the rest of the war, three years and four months to be exact, in prison camps. They were beaten, tortured, and starved. At some point, the Shalzar asked for a Bible. They brought him one, allowing him to keep it for three weeks. He says, I eagerly began to read its pages. I discovered that God had given me new spiritual eyes and that when I looked at my enemy officers 
and guards who had starved and beaten my companions and me so cruelly. I found my bitter hatred for them changing to loving pity. Now listen to this. He survived and dedicated his life to missionary work in Japan. One of his converts was Mitsutsu Fudishia, the lead pilot in the Pearl Harbor attacks. You let that sink in for just a second? Fudisha became a, an evangelist, and then Jacob the Shalzar died in Salem, Oregon at the age of 95. Do you see what holiness can do in the lives of other people? So he calls us to be hopeful, calls us to be holy, and then the last thing I promise, he calls us to be in reverence for God. Okay, notice what verse 17 says. It says, for you, if you appeal to the Father who judges impartially, which is really cool, here the text specifically says that God is in fact a Father, but as a Father, He is one who judges impartially. He's a perfect judge that is also a Father. It's really cool. We don't have time to unpack that, but go back and read through that, study it. I think it's a great thing to look through. According to each one's work, you are, listen, to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. So he gives the context. I want you to live in a world that's not like yours, but you do so in such a way that you represent your father in reverence, in fear, where that's the driving force of what causes other people to say, man, you're different because you live this way. Now, I remember and I can understand this idea of fear or reverence because my dad put the fear of God in me when I was a little boy. And maybe you had that too, right? I don't know about you guys, but all it took for me was for my dad to look behind as I'm sitting in the car and he'd said, wait till we get home. And dude, that fear would just, I mean, I would, I would start apologizing for stuff I've never even done in my life. Okay, because, why? Because what, what I didn't want was to disappoint my dad and furthermore, I didn't want the consequence right? That's not what I wanted. But that way of thinking about my dad changed the way that I lived, right? And so think about it. That reverence towards my father encouraged me to do the will of my father, okay? So follow me. When my dad said something, he meant it. And I had a choice to make at that moment. Will I obey the will of my father or will I do what I want to do? And then I had to remember, disappointment, Led to consequence, right? And so what I didn't want to do is disappoint him or I didn't want a consequence. Here, it's worth repeating so that we constantly remember. Guys, God is to be revered precisely because he is God. He gave us life. He gave us everything. And our posture is one of reverence towards God. And guess what? Same thing as holiness here. Peter says the same way that that has an effect on people, reverence has the same way an effect on other people, not just in your life, but upon the lives of other people. Last thing I want to bring up is that word that we just finished um, looking at, um, and that was that word sober, sober-minded, right? And I love that word because what it brings up is this idea of making sure that we have clarity of mind, clarity of thought. Like the opposite of that <clears throat> is inebriated. That's an SAT word for drunk, okay? But inebriated here is the opposite of having clarity. You, you can't think clearly when you're inebriated. It doesn't work that way. Or when you're under the control of a substance of something else. And I've seen that happen before where somebody has clouded thinking. They, they don't say things right. They don't act right. None of that stuff. And so here, Peter is calling of the people to be sober-minded, right? And here's the thing. For all of us, it's a good reminder because the one thing that pollutes our minds, spiritually speaking, is sin. The one thing that clouds our way of thinking is, in fact, the ways of this world. And so Peter here is saying, I want you to make sure that you're thinking straight, that you're sober-minded, okay? Now, now, here's the thing, guys. If that's the very thing, sin, that clouds our thinking, and we know that we are a child of God, 
Why are we fooling around with stuff that's messing with us? Why are we going back to the very same stuff that we knew God redeemed us for? Why are we going back to the very things that we know enslaves us? Guys, as pastorally as I can say this, why are you going back to the thing that, that sold you a lie that's not going to really change you or make you holy? Why are you messing with that stuff? Get away from it. In fact, God even says that he, you're his child. So in other words, stay away and quit acting that way. Quit acting like you're not a child of God. And you may wonder, why, Paul? Why, what, what should motivate me all the more to stop acting like that? Well, listen to what verse 18 says. It says, for you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of God, of Christ. Which means the following. Listen, God redeemed you at a high cost. And he redeemed you with the thing that was actually going to change you. Which means that no matter how much intellect you put into it, you are never going to overcome sin on your own. It ain't going to happen. It doesn't matter how much willpower you have. The reason you're stuck, the reason that you continue to be enslaved the way you are, go back to the stuff, is because you're trying to do this on your own. When God, throughout his word, right through here, has been saying, listen, it's grace, 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 grace. You know how encouraging it is to know that you can literally lay down your guard and stop trying so hard and God's going to give you everything you need in order to be able to change you. Listen to me. God's, God's sending his son to die for you and his blood is not just effective for your salvation. It's empowering for your sanctification. So why are you fooling with stuff by yourself? Trying to use your intellect, trying to use your will. When God simply says what he says there, what redeemed you and what's going to change you is me. And you know how you continue to do what you're doing the right way? And you may be wondering, Paul, I'm struggling here. Why can't, I, why can't I continue to grow? I want this vibrancy. I want hope. Well, listen, the way that you learn more about the hope that we have, the Savior that we know, and the salvation that was brought is to be in the Word. You know how you get sin out of your life? You put the Word of God in your life. And you do that with resolve and with discipline. You allow the word of God to get in you so that it can work through you. But if you don't go with that kind of resolve and you don't go to the word of God so that it nourishes your life, you, I'm telling you, you will resort to your intellect. You will resort to your own will. You will resort to whatever you can try to figure out in order to change you, and it won't work. It can't. That's why God says you need me in order to change you. So follower of Jesus, let me encourage you with something, all right? One, if you're messing around with stuff that you know that it's the very thing that enslaved you before, get away from it. And then secondly, let, let me encourage you, be nourished by the word of God because you're possibly there precisely because you're undernourished with the word of God and you need it, Okay. Secondly, be reminded, believer, of what Jesus did for you. You guys remember that old hymn, There's Power in the Blood? You guys remember that? Listen to what it says. It says, would you be free from the burden of sin? Question mark. There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you overcome evil and victory win? You know how? There's wonderful power in the blood. Believer, not only get in the word, but trust in the grace that God has given you. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and you're wondering, why don't I have hope? Why don't I have the salvation that you speak of? It may be precisely because you never know, you've never known Jesus as your Savior. And what you need more than anything else today is to give up and to relinquish whatever control that you have in your own life and repent of whatever you're trying to do to fix your life and allow Jesus to be the one who fixes your life. Go to him, repent, believe in him, and he will change your life. And listen to me, guys. For the rest of us, as we live out this life and we live with hope, we live with holiness, we live with reverence for God, yeah, we might be peculiar, but we do so because we believe most assuredly of our hope and our salvation, and that stuff is for eternity. And it's secure. And that's 
why we live the way that we live. Let's pray together.